Okay, and we're recording. Okay, yep, I got the got the notice. And, and then I'm going to um, share your screen. Share my screen here. And Nancy's going to kick us off. Let's see, from beginning. Come on, there we go. Okay. All right, so as Jan mentioned, I'm Nancy Sonatel. She's Jan Rail, and we're on the staff at the Conservation Foundation. And we both really enjoy gardening with native plants and have had a lot of fun putting this together. Next. Okay. So mine hasn't it's, moved forward yet. Neither has mine. It's okay. Not, it's not advancing for me. <laughs> okay. Let me hit in this, I don't know why that's happening. Uh, we tested this out, let me get out of here for a second. Uh, I don't know why it is not advancing. Let me try this again. Good idea. There, share, okay, we're gonna try again. Oh, you've gotta be kidding me. There we go. There we go. Uh oh, it went too fast. Okay, I hit it twice, that's why it's delayed. So let's try this again. Oh, slow, slow move forward. Yes, there we go. So our organization has been um, around since 1972. That's coming up on 50 years. We are a nonprofit and our mission is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas and open space, protecting rivers and watersheds and promoting, um, promoting stewardship of our environment. We work in a number of different areas. We do land preservation and restoration, both with um, private landowners and with forest preserve districts and, and park districts. Uh, we work, we have staff working to clean and restore rivers and streams and offer initiatives like uh, river sweep for to involve residents in that. We have educators who staff who do um, environmental education for students. Um, Prior to last year in COVID-19, I think we reached um, at least a thousand students every year with teaching about, about nature. And then we do a lot of education and outreach and advocacy, a lot of presentations to get out the message about how great nature is and native plants and such. Next. I'm trying here. It's for some reason it's you uh, are. It's not low oh, internet there. Yeah. Um, just was it last year, or the year before we, we got accredited with the uh, land trust accreditation commission and Jan <laughs> could speak to the effort that went into that. She was responsible for all the documentation that had to be sent to the um, commission, but we were proud to receive um, the accreditation for meeting the highest national standards for excellence, um, sound finances, ethical conduct and such. So very pleased to have that designation. Next. Trying, I'm having technical difficulties here. There we go. Our primary con, um, the territory is in Illinois in the counties of DuPage, Kane, Kendall, and Will, uh, with some work in addition to Duquesne, LaSalle, and Grundy. Um, in fact, we have a program called Conservation at Home that with partners um, all over Northern Illinois into Wisconsin and Michigan. It's a very popular program. So our reach has um, extended beyond these, these four, um, well, actually seven counties. Our headquarters are at the McDonald Farm in Naperville. It's an organic vegetable farm. Next. Uh, to date, we have helped preserve 35,000 acres, which is nearly 200 parcels. Um, we're actually up to 45 conservation easements. A couple of them came in uh, recently. And as I mentioned, seven counties. You can see the dots on the map indicates all the all the land we have um, had an effect on there. So why is pres uh, preserving land important? 
Well, open space along rivers and streams protects water quality and our drinking water. Um, in our area, we get Lake Michigan water, but there are other communities in some of the counties in which we work where they are getting their water from aquifers. Um, and what we do on top of the land ends up into our groundwater and our aquifers. So it's important, important to keep all that in mind. So uh, why do, we are gonna be talking about native plants today. So we wanted to talk a little bit about why we're choosing native plants. And this picture illustrates very clearly, um, this is obviously a hot, dry period. And all the plants on the right are native plants, still green. The butterfly weed is still blooming and looking pretty. The turf grass on the left um, has gone dormant in the heat and the drought and is not looking pretty at all. But the native plants have evolved here to deal with the, the changes in our temperatures and uh, moisture, rainfall, and do very well. Next. And another reason we pick uh, native plants is uh, particularly the prairie plants is because of their deep root systems. And this picture illustrates it so well. Our turf grass that we put, put in is um, not native to this area. It's actually, it grows naturally in a moister, cooler climate. So it doesn't need very deep roots. They're probably three to four inches um, long, but the prairie plants um, can grow down to at least uh, 14 feet. So they don't need watering um, once they're established and they can go down deeper and deeper into the soil to get the moisture they need. Native plants also um, are very helpful along pond edges or stream edges for filtering water and absorbing water, holding it in the soil. They can break up clay soil, which allows for rainfall to percolate in and not run off. Um, having evolved over the centuries uh, with the insects and other wildlife, there's a mutually beneficial relationship between the two. Um, the plants feed the animals and the animals, um, especially the pollinators, pollinate the flowers. The native plants we're talking about today are perennials. So they're long lived. Uh, we encourage people to put in more flower beds and less grass, so that saves costs of mowing, and then they improve the soil. And they're very pretty. Here's a whole selection of flowers. Um, one thing to note, they're not like annuals that will bloom continuously all year long. So it's important to plant for the various seasons and for things that have um, plant things that bloom, say, May to June, and then something else. That blooms June and July uh, through the season. And the important thing to know is that your eye will go to whatever is pretty and blooming and you don't have to have flowers everywhere in your garden. It, it, your eye will move to what's prettiest and the, and the whole thing will still look pretty to you. Next. And plants are not just to look pretty. Uh, so this picture illustrates which we all know, but maybe don't think about all the time, that the energy from the sun flows through our ecosystems. And that's where the energy that we all need comes from initially. The plants convert the sun energy to usable energy for the rest of us. And it goes up the food chain from the grasshopper to the mouse, to the snake, to the bird, et cetera. And of course we, are dependent on plants too. We either eat them directly or we eat meat of an animal that's eaten, eaten plants. And this picture also adds in the importance of decomposers, whether they're mushrooms or other things that one finds in the soil, who break down decomposing plants and animals and then provides nutrients to the soil which the plants can then access. So we really do need to landscape as if our life depended upon it. The definition of landscape ecology is the science of studying and improving relationships between urban development and ecological processes in the environment and particular ecosystems. So Illinois used to be a prairie state. It's known as the prairie state. It used to be mostly prairie uh, with woodlands along the streams and the rivers. 
And so we want people to plant things in their gardens that um, would have been here before it was all developed and we can help nature and help us in doing so. Next. Trying. There we go. So Jan is going to um, take it the next section and talk about um, you know our planning for putting in the garden and our thinking, um, all the thoughts that went into choosing the plants that we chose. Okay. Um, thank you, Nancy. So this is uh, the Clow House, and right now there's a lot of perennials here in the front. I uh, hope you can, can you see my cursor, Nancy? Yes, yes. Okay, okay so, uh, uh, so the plans that we did, when I start, I'm gonna start here on the left side and then move to the right side of the cloud house and then here to the shady side, it's the east side of the house. Um, so when we start, I am also gonna lay, have a overhead aerial plan of this area. And so this part of the house here is actually facing south. Um, this is east on this side, and this is sort of to the south and west, and the north is on the other side. So I want to show you, this is what it looked like last year, and I'm going to go back. So this is what, right now there's usually a rain barrel here, but it's not there right now. So in this picture, this is the corner that I was just pointing at. There's the rain barrel. Um, this is the side of the house that is actually facing west, and this is the front of the house over here, and there's a sidewalk. So I'm going to start with sort of what you do to designing, what you think should elements you should think about, and then get into specific plants. So the first thing to think about is uh, what are the light conditions? And uh, we use one of our coworkers as a guinea pig when we did the presentations. Um, so she could ask us questions and, you know, she's very, you know, just learning. So there's a lot she doesn't know about. So first, um, what are the light conditions? When I talk about full sun, I want, I'm talking about plants that live in the prairie like these. These are uh, black-eyed Susans. They want full sun, hot direct afternoon heat is their preference. Um, and then also light shade. So a light shade, when I get into that, it's less direct sun, some morning sun perhaps, um, or out at tree's edge. This is like a light uh, dappled sun here in a woodland and that's getting heavier. Uh, partial shade is filtered light through like light tree foliage. It's less direct afternoon sun um, and a little a, a heavier shade. And then there's the ones that like full shade. And those are plants that, um, you know, are usually on our deep wooded forests. So when you look at plants, think about their original habitat. Uh, woodland plants can tolerate shade. They usually like a site that's not quite dried out, but there are plants that tolerate dry soil that are in woodlands. Um, and, you know, plants, prairie plants, on the other hand, can tolerate dry conditions. The next thing to um, think about, excuse me, <clears throat> is moisture. As I said before, if you know that what the original habitat is that the plants live in, it sometimes helps you to determine if it will tolerate dry conditions or very wet soil. Um, something else to consider when you talk about moisture is where the plant is when you plant it is salt. Those in the south probably don't have to worry about it as much, but um, on a driveway or on the road, if road salt is getting onto your plants, it can kill them. And I will I'll, will be talking about, and I'll mention if a plant is actually salt tolerant. So, and also as Nancy mentioned, when we say they tolerate wet or dry conditions, that is once they are established. So when you first put in your perennials, you really need to water them. Um, and you can't let the ground dry out or they will, you know, die from that. So starting with the plant characteristics, what do you think of when you think of plants? You got to think of a lot of different factors, the size, the color, the contrasting foliage, the bloom season, textures. There's just so many elements uh, when you think about it. So to start, I'm going to talk about like when I talk about growth habits. So there's different growth habits of plants when you start thinking about them. Uh, this is like a purple coneflower, echinacea. It's a vertical upright plant uh, is a good example. When I say vertical mounding, it is actually slightly taller than it is wide, but it is a sort of a wide plant. It still gets tall. Uh, next is the mounding. It actually is wider than it is tall. Um, this is a wild geranium. I'll be talking about this later. This is a coreopsis that I'll also be discussing later. Um, and when you plant them too, I wanted to mention that you got to consider, and I'll mention this later, uh, what their full growth size is. You don't want to plant them too close. Um, with that, 
So when does it flower? That's another thing, as Nancy mentioned. You want to have uh, full season, all the season interest. In the spring, this is a hepatica. Um, I'll be talking about spring ephemerals. They come up early spring, um, and then there's the summer blooming flowers. This is fall, the asters. And then think about sometimes winter interest. Uh, we have oak leaf hydrangea planted. It has some interesting bark that's sort of exfoliated here. They keep on their flower heads here, which is really interesting. And um, so the, the other reason you want to be able to uh, plant in all four seasons is you want to provide food for the pollinators all season long, especially butterflies at the end of the season when they want to um, have that food to make the long journey south. Uh, and then colors. You want a warm season. I consider these warm season or warm colors, reds, oranges, yellows, or you could even do a cool season or cool colored plants, blues, um, purples, those type of things are more of a cool garden. You could always do a, uh, like a Monet style garden, do a lot of different blues, or you could do a dollar different pink hues as an idea. It's, you know, it's your garden. It is really up to you as far as you want to do what you want to do. And also when you're planting, think of the impact of the plants. You want to plant in large masses. Um, I generally do threes and fives and sevens, odd numbers, and I stagger them. Um, and, you know, I try and avoid straight rows. This is a purple cone flower behind a, a black eyed Susan with a uh, quinine. And I'm not saying the botanical names. When I get into the presentation, I will talk about the botanical names because that's critical. When you're looking for plants, you don't want to get some plants mixed up. Um, and there's uh, benefits to, you know, using natives versus cultivars sometimes. And I'll get into that. And also when we were talking to our coworker, uh, she, we, I mentioned that some plants, you know, spread by rhizomes and she goes what's a rhizome so this is really basics but for those of you that don't know um, to start with is that um, like the rhizomes of the um, so a rhizome is a, actually a sort of over here this is a rhizome and it is actually a horizontal stem and it sh shoots up plants as it goes and a great example of that is a ginger, which a wild ginger I talk about later, or the iris plant, and they're just below the surface. And this is a stoloniferous uh, rhizome. So plants sometimes will send out shoots and along nodes, they'll send up plants along there as little clones of them. And so the next one I, is a corm. Some plants have a corm. So it's actually, this is a, a the corm is actually like a storage organ for the plant's food. I'm um, pretty basic here, um, crocuses, gladiolas, and it's actually um, a swollen stem base is what this actually is. And I'm gonna jump over it versus a bulb. A bulb is actually uh, modified leaves. And as again, when the plant goes dormant, all the food is stored in this area. So that's why it's important to keep the leaves on those plants. I know the like I, my daffodils last forever, but um, that's when you plant other plants around them that will cover up the foliage. But uh, you want to keep those uh, stems there so they actually, or the leaves there, so they actually have food for storage for the blooming next season. And then there's also the fibrous roots. You're probably familiar when you pull it, if you ever see sod, those are all fibrous roots. A lot of plants have those. And the tap root is a, um, a straight uh, tapering root, and it sends out fingerling, fingerling like roots. Uh, I don't know what to call them, coming out from it. Uh, Baptisia that I talk about later is that type of plant. If any of you have ever pulled a dandelion, that is, has a, a long tap root that if you don't get, uh, it'll come back. So native versus cultivar. So natives are actually the original species of a plant. And it, language gets confusing. And when you hear of a cultivar, it is actually a plant that is cross pollinate or they've grafted it to another plant to get certain characteristics they want of that plant. Uh, they either want larger flowers, if they're shorter or taller, uh, disease resistant, insect resistant. Uh, so, and this is why I'm talking about botanical names that are important. Um, these are um, both Andropogon giardii. This is big blue stem. Uh, the difference is though, this big blue stem actually gets six to eight feet tall. Uh, you can see it has a bluish stem. It has a gold flower in, in a, later in the season. This, it's not real noticeable though, the flower. It's like a more like a seed pod. And this is uh, the same plant, black blue stem, but it's a variety of Blackhawks. And you can see the stems are black. Uh, the 
seed or, fl or flower it produces is brown in the later in the season and it but it only gets four to six, six feet tall um, and it's also but it's wider it gets 24 to 36 inches wide uh, the big blue stem actually gets 18 to 24 inches wide so this is things you think about when you difference between cultivars and natives uh, aster same thing this is a plant we're actually are showing later it's um symphio I uh, hate pronouncing these names. Symphio <laughs> uh, uh, trichum uh, novi anglii. Um, it's a purple dome. And it's, again, it's only 18 to 24 inches high. It's great for compact areas. Whereas this is another aster. This is a native, New they're both New England asters. But uh, it gets much taller. It gets three to four feet tall. It spreads. It's much different. So this is why you need to look at whether it plants a cultivar or a native when you go to purchase it. And other things to consider. You want three to four seasons of interest, as I mentioned. Um, and also you want to plant for pollinators. You want to keep the birds, uh, bees, butterflies, food all season. And as I mentioned, you want to have the appropriate size plant for the area you have. You don't want to have to keep fighting it and cutting it back or having to uh, relocate it. You can, but it's not the easiest. And also, I'll be showing you some scenes at our the house that we're the cloud house where we're hiding. You can use plants to hide or screen things you don't want to see. And also, um, things to consider too is a characteristic of the the flower shape. Is it spike? Is it a daisy like? Is it cup shaped, bell shaped? And again, mentioned mentioning that you want to be sure that you use the botanical name of the plant. So let's jump in here with the, 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 the garden. So again, yeah. I'm, yes. Before you go on, um, you have your video still off. So maybe you want to. I, I had it off on purpose so people concentrate on the. Uh, oh, OK. So they don't All see right. me. <laughs> I could have my picture, but I'd rather they concentrate on the pictures and not see me. OK, uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so I'm starting with um, when I'm talking about the design, and we'll move it on into it onto it, the next slide. Um, this is a walking path up going up to the main entrance of the Clow House. And our garden basically starts right here and it sweeps around to the front. And this is what we consider the left side of the Clow House. Uh, this area back here, we're not working on. Um, that hits all that black eyed Susans, but we are starting from here forward. So the next plan shows you what I'm gonna be talking about. And as I mentioned, as I'm going through the plants, I'm starting here in the back, and I'm gonna go around to the front of the house and I'll start talking about each of the plants that we have selected uh, for this design. Uh, this here is a little path that we put in because where this rain barrel sits, we have classrooms or we did have classrooms come to our office. We hope to continue that in the future uh, to discuss uh, rainwater, rainwater harvesting and, and other uh, sustainable practices in your yard. So with that, I'm moving on to the next, the very first plant, which is uh, Baptisia. Uh, it's also, uh, blue wild indigo. It's a beautiful plant. It blooms in the early spring and it's very shrub like. It gets about three to four feet tall. Um, has a blue flower and it likes the full sun. Again, so this is, I'm going to go back for a second. I didn't mention. So this is um, the south side of the house. So this whole area here is a south side. So that's why we're looking at, looking at plants that really like the sun. Um, and then this is a, a seed pod that it has in the that comes out in the fall. Uh, this is a plant This is actually salt resistant, um, rabbit resistant, which is critical in some things, but these are little seed, they rattle. They're great little, you know, rattle in the, the fall. Uh, and I actually leave, for my garden, I usually leave all my seed heads on. I leave my, uh, in particular, when I talk about some other ones, Echinacea, because the birds like them. Sometimes they'll feed on the seed. Um, this is uh, Anna's Hyssop, uh, Blue Fortune. It gets uh, 24 to 36 inches tall and in the plan. So this was the uh, uh, wild blue indigo. And this is uh, um, anise hyssop in front of it. These will bloom at two different times. So this is early spring. And then this is going to bloom in, excuse me, from June to September. It has spike flowers, uh, like sun to part shade, moist conditions. Its foliage actually, actually has a licorice scent. And then the next is, um, I love this plant, it's uh, prairie drop seed. So in this plan, it is this low grass that goes all along the front here. And it's very feather-like. It's uh, and it has, actually has like a seed head. This seed head here comes up uh, about August to September later in the season. And when it comes up, it smells like 
uh, a lot of people say buttered popcorn. I think it smells like cilantro, the herb. Um, and this is an example of it. This is in the foreground. It's actually in my garden in my backyard. Uh, this is in the foreground. There's some black-eyed Susan and purple coneflower behind it. So I'm going to use this plant actually to sort of uh, screen other items that may be coming up below it that are going to die back. And you'll see that here when I get up into this area, some of the plants there. And also, uh, the other reason I plant it is it is a warm season grass. So it comes up, a, it'll start coming up a little later. It won't cover those spring plants that are coming up. And this is a great example of what I'm talking about. This is a um, allium. It's in the, um, and it is a, gets 12 to 18 inches high. And these are the purple plants that are shown here on the plant. And they're gonna come up through the, the prairie drop seed. They're probably gonna come up, they're gonna come out before that because um, they actually um, bloom in April to June. And they have this large flower, it's about eight inches wide. Uh, it's also called Star of Persia. It gets like full sun, well-drained soil. And then after it's done blooming, the, the foliage here is gonna die back because um, it is, uh, you know, it, it dies back. And the, so the prairie drop seed is actually gonna cover that foliage so you don't see it later on. And next to that in the plant, I'm gonna have Coreopsis. These are the yellow plants. As I mentioned, I like to plant in clusters of five. Um, there's three here, they're separate, but these are gonna be lower than the Coreopsis and the Coreopsis are gonna come up through the prairie drop seed. I'm sorry, I'm the core, yeah, and uh, they get about 24 to 36 inches tall. You'll hear me say that a lot. A lot of these plants are about two to three feet tall. Full sun, dry conditions, um, and this is like the one I mentioned that was vertically mounding. It's easily divided. This is a great starter plant. If you're just starting gardening, it's easily divided. It has um, roots that grow along the like, rhizomes that it's a uh, rows are long and spreads. It's a great starter plant if you're, you're just starting out uh, gardening. The next plant is butterfly milkweed. This is one of my favorite uh, milkweeds, Asclepias tuberosa. Uh, butterflies love it. And on the plan, it's this cluster of three here. And we, another thing to consider is repeating elements. I like to repeat the elements in the garden and not overdo it with too many plants. So this is a cluster of uh, uh, butterfly weed and it does attract uh, the pollinators. It attracts butterflies. Uh, this is one of the plants they really like. It, uh, it can tolerate dry conditions, um, but it does grow in wet areas too. It attracts hummingbirds also, and it blooms in June to August. It has this bright, unique orange flower. Um, as I mentioned, it attracts hummingbirds. And the next plant is uh, uh, Lesser Calamint Calamintha nepeta, subspecies nepeta, and it has these tiny white flowers that come up on these stalks. And these are gonna be planted behind the uh, a butterfly weed and the it blooms June to October so these white spikes are going to be coming up and contrasting with the um, orange flower and just when you're planting these plants also and I think Nancy's going to mention it later is you got to give them time most uh, native plants to really look good it takes about three years for your garden to get established so the first year you might not have that you're not going to have these tall plants it takes a while for the perennials to grow in so you got to be patient um, and actually the flower has a fragrance to it. Um, and this is the plant right here. It's gonna be growing up behind the uh, butterfly milkweed. And now I'm gonna be moving to the front of the house. So I've talked about what we're planting in this area. And now I'm gonna move into the front. Now these rocks that you see in the planting bed, uh, we are actually removing these rocks. This is a memorial rock. And we're gonna address this later. We have a downspout here that looks pretty hideous. And <laughs> We'd like to see if we can get it diverted, put it under, or do a French drain, which is like a, a gravel area that's buried where it can drain into, but we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do here to get it under our sidewalk possibly, or bury it so it's not so visible and is unsightly in this garden. Uh, this downspout here will disappear in the summer, and this is with a downspout that will feed right into the rain barrel that's right here. So I'm starting out with uh, a plant, as I mentioned, this is a, a Dodocathion, uh, media, which is a shooting star. And this is a, what's called a spring ephemeral. So these are the plants, they're right here along the edge of the sidewalk. They tolerate uh, dry conditions. But what's gonna happen is, and this is a garden in Naperville that uh, Nancy did, and it's really pretty. This is a uh, shooting star. And a lot of times when you see the height of a plant, it's giving you what the flower 
what it looks like when it flowers the height, the leaves will stay low on this and these flower stalks shoot up. And these little plants here, this, so this is like um, early April and, or mid, actually mid April. And these are the prairie drop seed that I mentioned that are just coming out. So you can see that these are gonna pop up way before the prairie drop seed comes up. And then when the foliage, uh, the flowers die, the foliage actually dies back in the summer. And what we're gonna have is so this prairie drop seed is actually gonna grow over the top of the um, shooting star. And the prairie drop seed also, it's hard to tell from this plan, but the plants actually sit, the closest we have is 18, a foot and a half off the sidewalk because they really um, flow outward as you saw in the picture. So that's something to think about. Make sure you have it far back so it's not falling over the sidewalk. Uh, next is one of my favorite plants, uh, purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea. Uh, they get three to four feet high. Again, their main leaf mass is a little bit lower. This is the same garden in Naperville. So you can see the prairie drop seed is coming out. This is late in the summer because the prairie drop seed is put uh, flower heads up and this is a purple coneflower. So in this picture, it's this cluster here and there's a cluster over here. And when I get to the other side, the right side, there's gonna be a cluster of uh, purple coneflower there. The finch love the seeds. I keep the seed heads on here all winter. They look like little, they look like little thistle and the birds love them, the butterflies love them. All summer we had, uh, in, you know, the birds and insects just absolutely love these plants and it's one of my favorite flowers. Um, so growing in between, you know, think about color and contrast. So you're gonna have the orange uh, butterfly weed here and this is a, a purple poppy mallow hard to say, or wine cup. And uh, the reason it's important to have, this is a perfect example of why it's important to know uh, the, uh, the, the, cult, the, the genus and subspecies of it is because Nancy and I, when we met to discuss the plan, I, I said, I'm, I have this plant I'd like to use. And I said, it's uh, the purple poppy mallow. And she goes, well, I have this one called wine cup. And then we realized we were actually talking about the same plant and we had no idea. And so we found out, oh, that's what I'm talking about when we saw the, the, the genus name of the plant. So that's why it's important. So you'll see that this is sort of a spreading plant. So the idea is that when we plant it and it's hidden back here, it's actually gonna send out these long leaves and send the flowers, the purple flowers up in between these plants. And as we go, we're actually gonna you know, be showing what it looks like first year, second year and, and keep doing these webinars uh, throughout the year and for, you know, as we have this project proceed. So and next, yeah. A, a question came in that could be addressed now, I think, um, and that is how, how big these flower beds are. So like, do you know the depth from the uh, side to the flower uh, Good question. Let me, I have, next to you? I do have my plans here and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get, well, you can't see, I'm getting up to see how big they are. So the, Depth of the sidewalk, and I don't have my scale here. So it's about, uh, if I recall, it's about, I wanna say, so each square was, a, I'm, I did a quarter inch scale. So it's about, uh, about they're about, would you say four or five feet wide, the planting beds in front? I think they're about four feet wide to five feet. Oh, I think it's more. All right, I'm gonna get up and look. <laughs> I don't, I don't have my measurements here uh, to actually look and see. I'm trying to see if I have them here. I don't have them written down. I should have had that ready. We can always. I think it's more like seven or eight feet. Oh, that wide? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because each of these plants, well, that's a good point. Because this is, uh, I left, you know, like four feet for here, two feet for there, another two feet, two feet. So Nancy's probably right about 10, uh, about 10 feet wide then. I was way off on that. Um, so next I'm moving on to the, this is gonna be the background. So this hedge, um, a rubber row of shrubs behind here are below the windows. They're small, as you can see, sort of uh, globe-like plants or shrubs. These are New Jersey tea. It's one of my favorite plants too, as a shrub. It's, it's a, there's very few native shrubs um, and in the prairie too, because it was mostly grass. So there's very few shrubs out there, but this is one of my favorites. It uh, gets only three to four feet tall. It blooms these white flowers in June, June to July, and it likes sun, part shade, it attracts hummingbirds, butterflies. And it, it's got its name because during the American Revolution, um, they actually used this, uh, the leaves for tea. 
And it's something of interest also. So it's hard to see here, but these are actually sort of like yellow stems. So in the winter, there's going to be yellow stems coming up behind. You'll be able to see those after the leaves drop off. And next is uh, uh, pussy toes. And it gets its name, obviously, from this uh, shape of the flower here. And the, uh, so the pussy toes is right here in front. And this is the memorial rock that we're going to keep there. And again, the foliage is mostly lower and these flower stems shoot up. They get only, uh, the height is only six to 12 inches. So they're pretty sh short and, uh, and the foliage stays at the base. And then behind this rock here, the next plant I'm gonna talk about here is the uh, Terex Pennsylvanica, the common oak sedge. And it uh, is eight to 12 inches high. And it has a green, they say flower, but it's not real conspicuous. It's green, it's April to May. Uh, well drains like sun to part shade. Uh, it's native habitat or thickets, dry air, wood areas, but it's great for massing. And, and actually, if, you've, if you have like a dry slope that you don't want to mow, this is a great alternative to grass. Um, you can mow it if you want. They recommend at the most uh, two to three times a year and only at and at really at your mower at its high setting, setting, you want it at least two inches high. So this is, a, but this is a great massing plant, uh, plant it in large masses to get the effect of the, the flowing grass and the, the look of that. And finally, I'm moving on to the next plant I'm talking about is here is the uh, Wild Sweet William or uh, Phlox Maculata. And I absolutely love this plant. I have it in my garden. It gets um, about, uh, three feet high. It's pretty high. It's definitely a background plant and it blooms from June to August and it's uh, like sun, part shade again on the south side and ours is actually sitting on the top of like a berm, a hill and it gets, it's, it's tolerates a lot of dry conditions but this is actually these butterflies, these swallowtails are actually from my yard this year on the plant. They were absolutely gorgeous and my husband was saying, I don't remember seeing so many butterflies. Well, we never were home in the afternoon before, I pointed out. So this is the first year we've actually sat around and seen our yard with all the insects coming and the butterflies. And these swallowtail were on it nonstop. And these bloom actually really late uh, into the season. They go uh, from June to August. And actually, I think I had some of mine still coming around in September. So now I'm going to move on to this other side of, of the, the house here. Oh, so I'm going back. So this is, I just ended here. And now this is a sidewalk coming up and I'm moving to the other side that's over here of the house. So you can see from this plan, the area I talked about was here. Um, these are some steps coming up. Uh, there's a little gravel path. Um, and this area is na uh, pretty narrow. Uh, someone's gonna ask how narrow. Would you say about four feet, Nancy? Or three less, more. yeah, three to four. It's much narrower there. Much narrower, yeah. and. So again, I'm gonna go a little closer here. You can see we have some areas that we wanna screen. Um, there's a pipe coming out, there's an electrical box. We don't wanna hide the windows here so people can still see out. See in Nancy's office there, right? Uh, and we have some plants here. So we're, we're gonna be removing these uh, yucca. They, they started there by volunteering uh, seeds. And so here's the other side, looking from the other, other direction. This is an area I just covered. Uh, I'm moving on to this side and I'm not going to repeat some of the plants I just talked about. And again, this is a close up of the area that we want to cover. So again, this is a very small plant. It's a small area. I'm repeating the prairie drop seed that's here. Uh, these are the shooting stars that are going behind it. They're going to pop up. And these are the purple cone flower. Again, repeating some of the elements that were on the other side. So the two new plants I'm going to introduce are this uh, aster and then this uh, shrub here. So New England Aster, and this is the one I showed earlier. This is a uh, the purple dome. It's much more compact. It's, it's, so it fits into this area when it's full. So when we get it, it's gonna be fairly small, but we're planning for it full size, get, size, giving it plenty of room. It gets 18 to 24 inches tall. It keeps this glow form, which is nice. So it stays sort of contained. A uh, bloom September to October. So this is a late blooming fall plant. The purple color is beautiful sun, it likes sun. Um, it's found in a lot of prairies uh, in, in along stream banks. And then one of my favorite shrubs that just came out was this proudberry. It's a, it's a uh, cultivar, Sophie, of the coral bear, Symphio uh, carpus. Like this is the shrub over here at the corner. It's an accent plant. It does have white, tiny white flowers, but I think the rear 
Ah, real charm of this plant are the purple berries that appear in the fall. And I think it'll look beautiful next, uh, contrasting with the um, purple flowers here of the aster. And so with that, I'm moving on again to the, uh, this is the east side. Uh, and so again, so I'm gonna show you the, we're, there's some areas here that we wanna hide. Uh, we're removing quite a few of these rocks that are here. We are leaving some. And I gotta explain, we, our office is on a 60 acre farm. So we have places to put all these rocks. We actually have a rock pile from everything when they farm, you, you come, up, come up against all these rocks. And then also this is, Nancy's gonna show this later, but I'm gonna go back. So the bed line that I'm showing up, it's, it's gonna come off of here. It sweeps down, comes around the rocks, uh, returns and goes up to the other side here. And part of my reasoning when I plan, or when we plan beds, is um, the ease of mowing. Uh, in our backyard, I've removed like most of our grass by now. And I always think of how long it's gonna take me to mow and I hate mowing around trees or mowing around objects in the yard. So I usually end up putting a planting bed that ends up growing into a larger bed every time you look. Um, my son's friend said, every time I come over your house, you have less and less grass, that's my goal. Um, so this is what's existing now and Nancy's gonna talk about it later, what we did here. But there's some areas when I talked about areas you wanna screen, we have an electric meter, we have a gas meter, these pipes are coming out the other side. So we're gonna put some shrubs to try and screen it. Uh, this is another uh, window well that's sort of sort of unsightly in the area. And so this is the plan that I've mentioned. So that comes down here, it's gonna sweep around the tree here. As I mentioned, these are some rocks that are left. We have a bench in this area. Again, it's sweeping all the way around, comes up and connects with the back of the house. This is the east side of the, the building. Uh, this dash area is that shrub I just showed you, um, the Sophie Podocarp uh, Symphiocarpus. And this is an existing tree that's there. So this area does get uh, quite a bit of shade. It gets the morning sun, uh, but this area will be shaded by the tree. And it gets some, this side will get more afternoon sun as the day goes on from the south. But there is another tree right over here that sort of shades too. So I'm moving on. So I'm gonna start with, and when I'm describing the plants, I'm starting at the back of the bed with the tallest plants and then moving forward to the other plants that are in the front of the bed. So I'm starting with these oak leaf hydrangea. So there's three here, there's three over here, and these are screening those two areas that I showed you earlier that were pretty unsightly. So this is the oak leaf hydrangea. I, absolutely, I have this in my yard. It uh, gets, and, it, and you can, it's gonna be by a window. So this is this here, you'll see a window here, but you can cut them down uh, after the winter, I've cut, we've cut ours down to the ground and we've actually transplanted them and they've done really well. Uh, they, they spread by um, like runners that are un, under the ground here. And sometimes you do need to, you know, if you wanna contain it, you gotta cut them back, which is what I do a lot. Um, they get about five to eight feet high. These white flowers come out in May to June and it gets its name from the shape of leaf. You can see it, oak leaf, it's a beautiful plant. This is a beautiful fall color. It gets its nice maroon colored foliage and it remains for quite a while. And these flowers sometimes remains through the winter, it depends on how windy it is. And I'm, as you saw before, I had the exfoliating bark. It likes sun to part shade, so it will tolerate uh, quite a bit of shade also. And next is a, a service berry. This is one of my favorite trees. We have it, again, in my yard. Um, it has multi stems. It's, it's called what we call an understory tree. So these typically have grown under larger trees so they can tolerate some shade um, and it likes moist, well-drained conditions and it's on that slope so it, it'll be fine. Ours is actually on a slight berm too. Uh, it produces so in the beautiful white flowers and in the later in the season in the fall, it gets uh, these purplish black berries that birds absolutely love um, and they are edible. So if you wanna eat them, I made jelly out of them. Um, they're, they're great berries. The only thing um, I would caution on, and it actually has a beautiful, I wanna to mention too, it is a beautiful reddish orange foliage. I should have shown a picture, but it does have a pretty fall color. But the berries, if you're putting them, uh, be aware, I'd avoid putting them over a driveway or a sidewalk. We know from firsthand experience, my husband parked under our service berry and the birds were up in the tree eating them and uh, tended to cover his car with a uh, bird poop. So it was, I mean, it was purple. It was like, it was 
like did not look good and he had to go get it washed. Also, um, we had to over a sidewalk. Another word of caution is they stick to your shoes and you will track them in the house. So I'd avoid, if you can, um, it does happen. I have to just sweep them up in a, all the time to keep them uh, contained. Um, can you go back? I want to do. Oh yeah, I, go ahead. Something, um, a couple of questions have come in about how can you tell something's a cultivar? So I just wanted to mention that with the name here, the, the first and second words there are the genus and the species. And then after that, if it's a native, that's all you'll have is the genus and the species name. If it has another name after it, like this one is Autumn Brilliance, then you know it's a cultivar. Uh, right. They're often shown in parentheses, or not parentheses, but like yeah. apostrophes. Yeah. Um, but a straight native will have just two words for its name. So yeah. I just wanted to mention that. Good question. And I also neglected to point out where these are on the plan, I've realized too. So the, I have these three little dots. These are the three service areas. As I mentioned, I like to plant in threes. Uh, and they're pretty far apart. As I mentioned, they're, you know, they get 20, 25 feet wide. And this is a really large area. I don't know if you could tell from the picture, but it is a very, very large area that we're going to be planting here. And from the picture, I don't know if you could tell, it slopes downward this way. So this is why the area drains and is, is sort of dry. And a couple uh, of people have asked about uh, what software you use for your plans, to, um, Dan. Actually, I drew those by hand. <laughs> so I'm old school. My background, I'm a landscape architect. Uh, went to Purdue, go Purdue, Boilermakers. Um, and uh, my husband went there too. We're both landscape architects. So we always have to compromise. Um, right now, we're redoing our backyard. Uh, and my kids were like horrified about all, everything we've taken out. But it let, we had a lot of stuff dying. Uh, the landscape's about 20, 25 years old and some short-lived stuff. So, yeah, I, I drew this by hand, uh, and I, I learned AutoCAD sort of. Everyone's done by AutoCAD now. I don't know how to use it proficiently, so I just drew this by hand. So that's where the plan came from. Um, going back, so this is the blue mist flower back here. Um, it, if those of you that are familiar with annuals, this flower sort of looks like the uh, ageratum. And I'm going to say right now, we are going to go over on time. So if you want to stick with us, great. Um, the video will be available on YouTube. Uh, uh, after this, after we're done, we'll have it uh, added to our YouTube video collection uh, is YouTube with the Conservation Foundation. So if you have to go, I'm, I apologize, we are running over. We had a lot of plans and a lot of things to cover. So if you have to go, we will be recording this and you can find it on YouTube later. So with that, I'm going back. Um, so this is a, a mist flower. It does tolerate uh, shade. It gets 18 to 36 six inches high, so it's fairly tall. Again, I put the taller plants in the back as you move forward. And uh, medium moisture, part sun, it does tolerate shade, as I mentioned. Um, if you have rich soils, they can be aggressive. So you got to, you know, in some areas, so, but it's fine here. It's a little bit drier. It's a little bit not the greatest soil that we have in this area. And so next I'm moving on to the zigzag goldenrod, uh, uh, Philodago family, the goldenrod family. So these are the yellow plants here and they get uh, 24 to 36 inches high. There it goes again. As I said, a lot of them are that height. Uh, back here, it's be next to the purple and they bloom uh, July to September. So while these are blooming blue in, in July, these are gonna start blooming yellow. And it gets its name from the shape of the stem coming up from the the base of the, the plant base. It has a zigzag shape, um, moist, well-drained well soil. So its habitat is woodlands, it's protected slopes. So it does tolerate some um, drier areas. And that next is another fall blooming flower. This is uh, comes out in August to October, the Shorts Aster, um, the Symphiotrichum shortii. And it's, uh, its habitat again is woodlands or savannas. Uh, and it's good, as I mentioned earlier, to have plants that bloom all season. So the short aster is right here in front of the hydrangea. And, and next I have some ferns. And as I mentioned, those are right here in the plan. And as I mentioned that, you know, if, if you have dense shade, because if something isn't blooming, you want some texture. And these are great ferns. They're one of the ferns that actually tolerate dry conditions. Uh, and it likes shade, so just a little sun. So that's sort of why it's back here. It's going to be a well-shaded plant. Um, it tolerates, as I mentioned, it tolerates drier soils, and it grows in you know thickets, woods, fields, 
Um, it spreads by um, rhizomes. So as I mentioned, it's going to shoot up. It'll shoot up little clone plants of itself. Uh, it's not a rapid spreader. I have it in my front yard, and it, it hasn't spread too much. It actually hasn't spread at all. It's still, it's, but it's only its second year, so it has to get established. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how it proceeds. Uh, this is one of my favorite shade-loving plants, Solomon's Seal. It's really unique. It has this arching, and it's all on one side. These flowers droop down. It blooms in May to July, these white drooping flowers. Hummingbirds like them. It attracts hummingbirds. Uh, and in the plan, uh, they're the backdrop to the ferns here. So, the, so in the summer, after the flowers are gone, later on, it'll develop these little droopy blue berries on the underside here. So these berries will line the entire underside. So they have a little contrast uh, to the green foliage. And next is my uh, big, um, big leaved aster. It blooms uh, August to September. It says, it says it's a purple, it sort of looks white, but it's a very light lavender. So it's here in the foreground. As I mentioned, it likes sun, the part, uh, shade, the part sun. So it's on the edge here. So it does get some uh, morning sun. It's gonna get some more afternoon and morning sun on this side. And it gets its names from its leaves. These heart-shaped leaves sometimes can be eight inches across, so they're pretty wide. Um, you're, uh, so in its, uh, I won't say what, so I'm gonna move on to this is actually, uh, these three here and these three here, as I mentioned, my clusters are three. And then next is one of my favorite plants, wild geranium. I have this in my yard too. Uh, it's actually right back here. It likes uh, part sun. Uh, it's shade the part sun. And so when the, this is a plant that will bloom sort of before most of the leaves come out on the tree. And it gets 18 to 24 inches tall. This is the one that I said was mounding. And it other name is wild geranium, but it's also what's called crane's bill because I uh, don't see it on the picture. The, the seed head looks like a bird's beak uh, when it's done flowering. And if you shear that seed head off, it sometimes get a, you get new growth. And uh, in this plan, it sees, as I mentioned here, and here's a large mass of it. I just wanted to show you in its natural setting. This is messenger woods. We'd gone on a hike and here's a whole mass of it. It's a great sort of low growing ground cover where things could come up through it. Um, and then in the summer, these will be just a green field. And I'm going to talk about this later. In the foreground here are some uh, May apples. And it's one of my favorite, I have a lot of favorite plants, but it's a nice uh, shade plant uh, for, for your garden, tolerates a lot of shade. And then next is the long beaked, beaked sedge. Uh, so to soften the rocks up and make it look a little nicer, um, uh, or it gives a softer look, are this long beak, beaked sedge. Uh, tolerate shade again, 18 to 24 inches high. It is actually deer and rabbit resistant. So if you're looking for a plant that uh, resists deer and rabbits, this is a great one. Uh, next is the wild columbine. Can I just uh, jump in there? Yeah. Uh, since you brought up sedges and the fact that um, the sedges look like clumps of grass, but they're very different and they can grow in the shade. So woodlands have a lot of sedges growing there. There are sedges that grow in the sunshine, but um, it's a great filler plant um, because grass doesn't grow in the shade very well. And so sedges can be used in their, in their place, which is really nice. Yeah, good point, Nancy. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is the uh, columbine, wild columbine, 18 to 24 inches tall. So it's a little shorter. So this is red clusters. It likes a little bit of sun. It helps it flower. So that's why these are sort of at the edge. Uh, this is a little bit deeper shade, but it will get the morning sun. It will get sun on this side. And so I put these near the plant bed edge. And so if you cut these, th these will be blooming uh, in April to June. Usually this little red yellow flower, it's absolutely gorgeous. It reminds me of lanterns to me, hanging down. Uh, it attracts hummingbirds because of its red color. And if you actually, after they bloom, if you cut them off, uh, it promotes it to flower again. Um, but they do form this unusual looking black seed pod uh, later on in the season. Next is a fun flower. It's a, a flower, I would call it a flower. Uh, Jack in the pulpit, 12 to 18 inches tall. It blooms this pulpit. It's this like Jack in the pulpit here underneath comes up um, in April to May. Uh, don't expect this to come up the first season. It takes a couple years, so be patient. It is a spring ephemeral. 
So it will become uh, dormant um, in the summer. And it develops a little red berry here uh, underneath too, to where the flower head was. It will develop this little red berry. And in the plant, it's up here in the deep shade. So it does tolerate and like deep shade. It's back here. Uh, it's among some other ground cover that uh, I'll be showing next. So this is the jack in the pulpit, sort of accents. As you walk along the path, uh, you'll see these little jack in the pulpit coming up. Uh, this is a great shade loving ground cover, wild ginger. Uh, I have it in my front yard. It's, it's a wonderful plant. It gets six to eight inches high. Uh, these flowers come out, they're hard to see. They're sort of under the leaf. Um, so they're hard to see when they come out, but it's a really pretty unique bell-shaped flower. Uh, and actually it got its name because it was actually used um, early colonial times. It was The root was actually used for ginger. It's not now, but it does have a ginger scent, um, uh, a serum canadensis. And uh, it's a, so this is the ground cover. So this is actually, you know, we're planting it here, but I expected that it's going to start spreading out, which is fine. I wanted to start covering up around some of the other plants that'll come up through it uh, as the seasons go on. So it's a spreading ground cover. It's slow spreading, um, and I expect it to happen as it as it grows on. And that's again, you follow the progress of our program, and you'll see what happens each year to year. Uh, next is a May apple, which I mentioned earlier. It reminds me of like little Lilliputians. I'm waiting for these little people to come out from under my little umbrellas. Um, this is the flower that comes out under it in uh, April to May. It's a white flower. And this is, it's called a May apple because it has this little apple-like structure and it grows in the shade. And in the plan, it is back here. It's in the uh, denser shade of the, the tree. This tree's here. It's gonna be under all these trees. Uh, understory trees, the service berry, so it's going to get pretty dense shade. So it, it will tolerate that, but you can see in this picture there's some on it, sun on it, and that's because it's early spring before the trees have leaved out, and uh, it's in the and its habitat is the woodland. Um, so with that, I am going. Oh, and um, so uh, this is uh, the plan again. So the, I went from the back to the front, and from here. I'm going to have Nancy take it over and talk about how we prepare the beds for planting. Okay, and before I start that, I'm going to address some of the questions I saw coming up, uh, some of the things that were asked. Um, so we are in zone 5B here. So that was one question. Um, another thing was will these plants work in other areas? And we can't really speak to that, but I saw someone else mention um, who's out east that um, they've used Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, which is a book we highly recommend um, for a list of plants. I think he's in Pennsylvania, Maryland. Yeah, I think he's in Pennsylvania. Um, anyway, out east, maybe somebody can put that in the chat or, or Q and A um, exactly where he is, but he, he does have a list of plants there. And there is, there is definitely some overlap, but if we were talking about prairie plants and you get as far east as Maryland, I don't think the prairie extended that far. I think it was into Ohio and maybe a little bit of Western Pennsylvania. Um, so it depends on your conditions and, and what's being offered in your area. So you would definitely have to look into that. Someone else, mentioned that the Kalamintha and the Allium are not native, and that's true. And I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, our presentation today is about putting in a garden next to your house, basically. And although we prefer total natives, we, we realize that there's a place for non-natives. And so if we recommended a cultivar in this presentation, it's because we know that it's still good for pollinators um, that's not true of all cultivars, but the ones we've used are still good for pollinators or, and or uh, we know they won't be aggressive. They're not gonna spread into natural areas or, or be a problem. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. And then what else? Let me see. Um, I think that covers it pretty much. Someone asked whether the proud berries are edible. I have no idea whether you know I, that. I don't think they probably, I wouldn't, I don't know but yeah. I wouldn't try it unless you absolutely know. Yeah, do, uh, there was a, do your research on it. We, we don't really know that. Yeah, and as, as Nancy mentioned, I agree that, you know, like in my yard, as I said, I, my husband's a landscape architect, so we have to compromise on our plants. 
and I would like more native, but you know, there's ornamentals too that look, and they're exactly what they say. They are ornamentals. They don't provide food for it. So we have mixed some non-natives in here, as she mentioned cultivars, just because, you know, there is a variety, as she said, it provides food for the pollinators. And, and why we were, Nancy was talking, I went back and looked at the, um, to, I'm looking at uh, the bed out front and the one area, narrow area between the sidewalk and the front of the house is actually six feet wide there. Um, I'm looking at the measure, yeah, one, three, yes, yeah, it's six feet wide. And that one planting bed I mentioned to the left and the other bed is only about, uh, it's three and a, uh, almost four feet wide there on the other side. So just to answer that question about how wide the bed was in that area. So with that, I'm, I don't want to interrupt or take away from okay. Nancy Friesen. Okay. So continuing on, yeah, we know, we know we're going over. So um, is someone put in the chat something we forgot to put on the list, Jan. And that was that before you do any digging, call Julie. So. <laughs> I can attest to that. They've been in my backyard all morning and I have flags everywhere and paint all over the house, all over our yard. So yes, definitely call yeah, Julie before you start digging. that might not be taking. a term that everybody on this, on this um, webinar knows, but Julie is the abbreviation for the, I guess it's an organization that comes out and locates where all your utility lines are so that you don't end up, you know. Digging up something. Digging up something important. So um, if you're planting in an area that has grass, like we are on the east side of the house, um, we just wanted to list a few of the earth-friendly ways that you can kill grass uh, using cardboard, newspaper with mulch on top or tarpet. Um, these, these do take several weeks for, for the grass to die. Um, so you have to have some time. You can also dig out the grass if you have a smaller area. It's kind of time consuming and back breaking, but um, can be done that way. You may have to resort to herbicide, um, particularly if you have a short time frame or stubborn plants like ground ivy. Um, we obviously, being a conservation organization, don't like to see a lot of use of herbicides and pesticides, but they do have a place because sometimes it's very hard to get rid of, rid of plants that you don't want otherwise. Um, and just a word of caution, don't basically paint yourself into a corner if you're using the herbicide because then you have to walk out over the area you've just sprayed and there's been some personal experience with that. You, if you walk through it and get the herbicide on your feet and then walk across your lawn, you will leave the herbicide behind and kill your grass. I can um, attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> So then you will want to move any plants that don't fit in with your design, uh, reuse them, relocate them, give them to a neighbor who does want them, something like that. Uh, we recommend making sure your plants in the pots that you know, you're going to be putting in are, are well watered either the morning of, if you're planting in the afternoon or the night before, just so that they're, they're in good shape before they go in. Um, we recommend edging the planting beds. You can use a spade for that. It makes a nice clean edge, um, it makes it easier to mulch and, and keep, it, uh, keep it nice, nice looking. We also recommend that you lay out uh, your pots in, in the beds before you start digging any holes. I mean, you may have your design here or have a, a general idea, um, but there's nothing like being out there in the space and, and putting the plants out. As you're spacing them out, make sure you're remembering um, what, they're, what size they're gonna be when they're full grown. It's, it's really easy to wanna put them too close together when they're little, um, but then they're going to be too crowded and that's not gonna work out very well. So you really need to space them apart initially. And then if you have killed your grass through uh, using herbicide, you don't have to dig it up. You can plant right through the dead, the dead grass. As I mentioned before, they have very short roots, so it really is um, not difficult to do. And then sometimes people think you need to rototill before planting, but we do not recommend that. There are uh, fungi and bacteria and other things in the soil that help keep the soil healthy. Um, help, as I mentioned before, provide nutrients to the plants. So you really want to disturb the soil as little as possible. So the other thing about rototilling, rototilling is it can bring up uh, weed seeds to the surface, then sprout. Next. Oops. 
So when you get to digging, um, you want to dig the hole slightly larger and slight, just slightly deeper than the pot. Um, and you don't want to be digging in wet soil. So if it's rained, even though the next day is very pretty, if your soil is heavy, like we have a lot of clay in our soil around here, you really need to let it um, let it dry out a little bit because you need to be able to cr crumble the soil that you've removed. Um, so when you put it back in the hole, it's it's a nice crumbly mixture and not huge crumbs. Um, when you put the plant in the ground, you take it out of the pot, obviously put the plant in the ground, the crown of the plant, so where the stems meet the roots, um, should be even with the ground, not below where water would sit there um, and not sticking out where the roots might be showing. And so you may have to, you know, backfill some if you don't have it or dig a little more uh, to get it right. You want to loosen the roots um, before you, when you take the pot, the plant out of the pot, you want to loosen the roots at the bottom and then place it in the hole, backfill with the loosened soil that I mentioned. Um, push it down all the way around with the palm of your hand or your knuckles or whatever. And then water again, even if your plant has been watered um, thoroughly, you want to water again. Um, just to make sure the soil is thoroughly saturated and it also helps fill in any air holes. You don't, all the roots need to be in contact with soil. So by watering, it helps everything settle in. And then it is not necessary to fertilize native plants. They just don't need it. Next. Oh, so to lay out our bed, we started with um, wrapping a garden hose around. We had the plant design there and we're sort of eyeballing where, where how it was drawn out with, um, um, with how it looked when we were standing there. And then when we were happy with it, then we, um, Jan took a can of white paint and and um, painted all along the hose. Then we were able to pull up the hose and started putting the cardboard down. Um, it's a pretty big area, so we needed a lot of cardboard. I recently had new cabinets put in my kitchen, so I had a lot of cardboard. Um, and also we needed a lot of rocks to hold it down. And fortunately there were a lot of rocks around. So we were, we were well set up for that. Um, you can also, if you're going to be mulching anyway, put bags of mulch on there, um, especially with newspaper that works well. Um, but you need something to hold the cardboard down so it doesn't blow away. Next, I think there's another couple. Yeah, yeah, here we are with all the rocks. You can just go through these. Okay. Yep, we did put a tarp down, which covered a lot of area. Um, was this the next one? That's what I had next. Yeah. Let's, let's move on. I'm not sure what we were going to say here. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. Okay. So we're planting for obviously for, for butterflies um, and also the birds. Um, didn't talk about this a whole lot, but when you put in the native plants, it brings in butterflies, which um, and butterflies are specific to particular plants often. Uh, so that's why it's good to have a diversity of plants that you put in. And they lay their eggs on the on leaves and then their caterpillars eat the leaves and then they feed the birds. So in the spring, the birds are feeding their young caterpillars. And Doug Tallamy did a great study on this. Something that chickadees need something like a thousand caterpillars to feed one nest full of fledglings, which is just astonishing. So the insects do not eat the leaves of say your lilac bush or any um, plants that have come in from other areas in the world. It's, it's um, a matter of evolution. And so we need to put in the native trees, shrubs and other herbaceous plants to provide food for the birds. This is a selection of birds who uh, most of them stick around all winter are pretty common here. If you go to the next slide, Jan, here are many of the songbirds that are migratory um, will just show up in the summer and we want to have plenty of food for them. Um, I'm looking at the um, indigo bunting in the upper 
upper left, um, looks like a scarlet tanager, Baltimore Oreo we have at the farm every year, um, cedar wax wings. I think, I think they go, they may move even farther north, but they certainly come through this area. Um, the um, uh, bluebird will come back for the summer and they all need insects for their, for their young, high, high protein for their young. Next. There are some birds that are not our favorites. So the upper right is the starling, which is a European bird um, and has done very well in this country, and unfortunately. And in some areas they can just move in and decimate crops. It's very unfortunate. Uh, and the Canadian goose is native to this area. Um, but they used to be farther north uh, most of the time and just migrate south because we've changed our landscape so much with the uh, detention ponds and such. It's the perfect habitat for them. They love the mowed grass around the edges because then they can see any predators that are coming. So we recommend that um, people plant native vegetation around the edges of their ponds. It helps clean, clean up the water and improves the proves the look and keeps the geese away some. And the sparrows are a problem. They can nest in bluebird nests and other, other places take over habitats that are good for our songbirds. We can, we can move on. Next. So we want to talk a little bit about when to plant and the best time being in spring and fall when the, when the temperatures are, are warm but not too hot or too cold. And, and then it's also, um, usually a decent amount of rainfall. I saw in the chat, someone mentioned being ready to plant now. In our area, it's it's a little too early, especially for tender new, new um, perennials. Um, our frost date is the middle of May. So that, you know, it can change from year to year. Um, unfortunately, with the weather apps, we can look ahead 10 days or so and, and see what kind of um, temperatures are coming. But generally speaking, we don't we don't plant in this area until May. Um, now that's for perennials and annuals. Trees and shrubs can be put in any time when the ground isn't frozen. They're not nearly as sensitive. Um, container grown trees and shrubs are a little easier to manage, but you can also go with um, bald and burlapped. If you're putting in a larger tree, you might want to hire a nursery or landscape company. Uh, to put it in, but we did want to mention that smaller trees actually are not a bad option, uh, not only being less expensive, but their root systems are smaller and so they haven't been uh, either confined or disrupted as much as the larger tree root systems and they can grow pretty quickly. You'd be surprised two or three feet a year for smaller trees. They can get established pretty quickly. Um, you do want to avoid planting during the hottest and driest time in the summer unless you're planning to be out there watering, watering all the time. That, that's a very stressful period for, for new plants. Um, and, and then the herbaceous plants grown in a greenhouse should be planted, especially those grown in a greenhouse should be planted after the last frost date because they're particularly tender. Next. So um, in, in our area, there are quite a few native plant sales around. Um, if you go to the Wild Ones Greater DuPage website, they have a list there. Um, that list is also on our website. And we are having a plant sale uh, coming up for members. It starts on April 30th and then the general public May 1st and 2nd. The pickup is on May 22nd. Um, we also wanna let you know that you can order from a a nursery in our area called Possibility Place. We have a link on our website. So they will ship you the plants. Um, or if you're, if you're in our area, um, you can call us and we'll see if we can help you. We do have wholesale accounts at a couple of um, wholesale nurseries. And then the local nurseries in our area that, that sell natives or the growing place, Wanamakers are a couple. And look for the natural garden natives pots. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that some growers put neonicotinoids. Um, I don't know enough about them to say whether it's something they put in the soil or whether they spray on the leaves. I don't, do you know, Jan? I don't know, I don't know. 
but I know they use neonicotinoids and which are something that keep the insects from eating the leaves. But that is a real problem if you're putting in um, plants that you want the insects to be eating the leaves and the native native insects never decimate your whole plant. It's just they nibble here and they nibble there and before they know it, a bird has come along and nipped them off. So it's not a problem, but it's definitely a problem if you're putting in um, milkweeds, uh, milkweed plants for the monarch butterflies and caterpillars. And uh, so you don't want to be putting in milkweeds that have been had neonicotinoids um, applied because then your monarch caterpillars will die. Next. Uh, so yes, we wanted to mention that the first year when you put in new plants, even these natives that are so hardy, you want to water regularly when there hasn't been much rain. The second year you need to water is needed during dry spills and the third year minimal additional watering um, is needed if plants are cited appropriately. So um, very important to know where plants live in their sort of native habitat um, because even the prairie plants, there's a variety. Um, Illinois looks very flat, but there are still some hills and some um, you know, areas at the bottom of the hill, which are going to be wetter than the top of the hill. And there are plants that live in gravelly areas and plants that live where it's mostly wet. So you really do need to know um, about where, where they are happiest so that you site them properly in your garden. And we recommend using rain barrels. Uh, rain water is so much better for plants and it helps keep the rain from running off the land. Um, Unfortunately, we kind of decide things to treat water as a waste product and we run it off into the storm sewers and into the streams and down into the Gulf of Mexico where it turns into salt water. Um, so we're all about keeping water on the land and rain barrels can help do that. We have them available year round on our, um, there's an order form that you can access through our website and people, People think that we don't sell them during the winter, but we do. And uh, we've had people buy them for give Christmas gifts and birthday gifts and such. Next. Mulching, there were a couple of questions that came up about mulching. Um, if you plant so that uh, when full grown, there's great coverage, um, you know, the plants are shading the soil, you won't have a big problem with weeds, but initially to keep the weeds under control, it is a good idea to mulch and um, we recommend the finely shredded hardwood mulch or you can leave leaves or shred the leaves. Um, if you have a big tree or something that you have to get the leaves off your grass, you can shred them and put them in your flower beds. I mean, that is the natural fertilizer in the woodland is the leaves falling to the ground. Um, and, and also mulching helps to keep the soil moist. So that's a good, good idea to do. And then we wanted to just touch on composting a little bit. Healthy soils make healthy plants. When, when plants have, um, are healthy and have good soils, rich soils to grow in, they are better to able to protect themselves from um, diseases and insects and such. So composting is a good idea. It helps you to keep your vegetable food scraps out of landfills. Um, and then help create good soil to put on, on your flower beds. A lot of people in our area are living in subdivisions that went into um, cornfields and such that are full of clay soil. So composting is a great way to keep improving your soil. And you can add leaves and other dry material to the compost. We have the webinar I mentioned earlier coming up on April 14th about composting. So you can learn all about it. And we also have some composter sales coming up. Um, a pickup in Kane County and one in DuPage County, May 15th and 18th. And we will be, you can go to the county websites to check out um, the link or they're not paste, posted on our website yet, but uh, we're expecting to get them up there. Next. It's acting up on me again. Come on, there we go. 
I mentioned earlier a conservation at home program uh, where we encourage people to put in native plants, create wildlife habitat, uh, water conservation. You can use native plants in areas where it's very dry or where it's very wet, um, putting in understory trees, bushes that like floodplain areas um, will not mind if part of your garden is flooded for a day or so, they will soak up the water and, and help reduce that problem for you. Um, I mentioned the composting and, and then also um, with a healthy garden, with a lot of diversity of plants, you bring in beneficial insects um, that are both good for pollinating, but also you bring in the insects that will eat the insects that you don't want. So um, in a proper natural situation, there should be good balance and you don't need pesticides. And as we also mentioned, the native plants don't need to be fertilized. So going from here, um, we recommend that you just start with what you have. You don't have to redo your whole garden. Um, you can do one section at a time. Um, keep in mind that gardening is an experiment. Um, so you may put plants in one place and find out that they've popped up somewhere else. And so we just suggest that you adjust and say, well, this is where they seem to be happy. Um, we'll leave them there and, and change our plans around a little bit. Um, through our conservation at home program, we do make house calls just locally in the four counties where we work. Um, so let us know if you would like an on-site visit. We'll, we'll come to um, your house and we can walk around the garden, see what you have, make recommendations if you have problem areas and such. And um, then you can always join the Conservation at Home program, which gets you a membership and information that um, the public might not have immediate access to. So if you have any um, you know, follow up questions that we have not addressed in this webinar. Um, if you want a conservation at home visit, here's our contact information. You can get in touch with us. I don't know whether. We have lots of questions. Uh, <laughs> and if you're willing to bear with us, uh, now there's 61. Um, I wanna, and I, we've gotten a lot of comments about uh, cultivars and native ours. And um, Christine is absolutely correct in the comments. She said that some are native ours rather than true natives. Example is a New England aster. Uh, native ours and cultivars are sometimes less, they are, well, native ours actually are less beneficial to pollinators and other wildlife. Um, I know there's some uh, hydrangeas out there, like the big ball ones, those are not real beneficial to the insects. And actually some plants are bred to deter insects. That's why I mentioned that because, so then you won't be getting the insects in that, um, or that are beneficial uh, to the area. So thank you for those comments reminding me. Uh, those are very good points. Um, and also there's a question about downspouts in the front when we talked about the downspouts. Someone asked if we could do a rain garden. Uh, we really don't want a rain garden right at our entrance. And we actually have a rain garden uh, right around the corner from that area that I was showing you. So um, that's why I didn't mention a rain garden there, but that is a possibility, but we really don't uh, want that at our entrance and you can jump at any time if you do. There's a question about when do you cut back oak leaf hydrangea? Uh, you want to, they bloom on the previous season's growth. So you prune them right after they flower in the fall or early winter. And you prune the growth uh, from the hydrangea um, about one third of the total growth. And you wanna avoid, so you can avoid cutting off next year's blossoms. Uh, we were moving ours, so I basically cut mine down almost to the ground, and uh, they survived, uh, but they just didn't flower that first year. So, um, and I'll answer, so we answered that one. And to answer the question about the gravel flagstaff uh, path area, uh, how do you set the gravel, meaning do you put something underneath like landscape cloth? Um, in that situation, you know, you could put down landscape cloth. You need to put down sand as a base, though, to set the stones. Uh, otherwise, it's really hard to level them. So put down sand. Uh, I don't know if we addressed, I can't remember, about uh, landscape cloth. I would not put it in my garden anywhere. Um, it's horrendous to deal with. We still come up around the base of the plants. Um, we installed a children's sensory garden. 
and I kid you not, there were like five layers of cloth and I kept pulling it up and pulling up and it just, and we had tons of weeds. I mean, that five layers didn't prevent any weeds from coming up. It was inundated. So I would, I would not use landscape cloth in my garden whatsoever. Just my personal preference, but that's. Agreed. I agree. <laughs> uh, so um, let's see. Uh, oh, I, and, and, go ahead. I just saw one that um, about, um, you know, is it okay to have daffodils and, and tulips and bulbs like that? And I would say, yes, the bulbs are no problem at all. Um, they they tend to be what we call the spring ephemerals. They come up and they bloom and then they die away. And it does no harm to have them in your garden. And they're very pretty. Who doesn't like to see those crocuses and things coming up first thing? Do you have another thought on that, Jan? No, I yeah, same. I love the crocus. I love the spring flowers. And actually, um, Roy Diblick has a great book too. And I'm looking for it. I have it here on my desk somewhere. Um, but it's called Know Your Landscape, K-N-O-W. I'm going to see if I can where did I bury it? Anyway, it's called Know Your Landscape. Roy Diblick, he has uh, Northwinds Nursery up in Wisconsin. And he talks about how you need to know your plants and what to plant. And he has a lot of bulbs in his gardens. He has daffodils and, you know, the, the crocus and stuff coming up in between like the uh, uh, prairie drop seeds. So in the spring, you have some spring flowering plants, even though they're not native and they're bulbs. But yeah, I do like having bulbs. I have them all over. Yeah, uh, and you can plant, like, like you said, you can plant them between other plants that are going to grow up bigger and taller. Um, um, but someone asked if do any of the plants I mentioned deter or attract insects that are unwelcome like mosquitoes and ants I don't know the answer to that one I don't know if you do Nancy but I don't know you know you're going to get bees and the bees just to mention you know people oh I don't want bees but the bees that are attracted to the native plants are not the yellow jackets that buzz around your food uh, so don't you know there's so many varieties of bees out there but the bees I've been my sons played football and knocked a football into our sedum that was covered in bees in the fall and they didn't bother them at all. They just went right back to what they were doing after he bumped them all off. So it's not the same as the yellow jackets that are that bug you. Yeah, um, a lot of people think yellow jackets are bees, but they're not. They're wasp or hornet family um, and a totally different creature. Um, but yeah, the bees are not a problem. In terms of plants, so I would say in terms of plants and ants and, and all of that, plants attract certain insects. And like I mentioned before, if you have a diversity, you'll get, you, things will be able to stay in balance. Um, the plants themselves don't necessarily, you know, keep ants out of your garden or anything, but um, it may bring in birds that will eat them and that sort of thing. Yeah, you're right. I'm just looking, someone asked if they could get a copy of the plan. Um, I can certainly send it to that person that uh, asked for the plan if she's if they're interested. I do have a small scheme, schematic of it. Uh, can we get someone asked if we can get electronic copies of the slides? Um, what I can do, and I'll do this later, is I have um, my plant list. It's hard to see. I'm trying to get it in front of my camera. There we go. Uh, I have a plant list of all the plants that we're using, and it has all the heights, the widths, the soil. Uh, moisture, sunshade, all the information about it uh, when it blooms. And I can send that out to everyone after the uh, webinar. And our person that uh, handles our webinars, Jamie, uh, she's out of town right now. So if, uh, before, I don't know how long it'll take before this actually gets up uh, on YouTube. Uh, someone's asking if some of the plants are deer resistant. Some, I mentioned some of them that were, but I'm not specifically know about each individual plant. Uh, you can probably and along find those lines I'll just mention because rabbits can be a big problem, uh, especially when the plants are little. Uh, rabbits don't like to eat things in the mint family. So that's Monarda is a good one to put in. Um, yeah, it, it would be. Yeah, Monarda. Yeah. yeah. Um, someone asked about, would you recommend any of these plants for next to a patio? I noticed that you said the cone flower grows tall and, and not as wide, um, but it would lean over the patio if, unless it has something around it to support it. Again, if you don't want, want something flowering, uh, the pussy toes that we mentioned, uh, prairie drop seed is great, uh, low growing. It doesn't, you know, as I mentioned, it's mounding, clump forming. Uh, some of the lower growing items, it depends on if it's sun or shade. Again, it depends yeah, on the shady, condition. You could use some sedges that don't grow quite as tall, but. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm just, we're going through, there's uh, 56 questions. So we're scrolling down. Uh, and again, people are asking 
if they can get the plans, I can send those out to everyone on the email list. Um, and one thing we didn't, I just saw someone uh, mention part shade. One thing we didn't really talk about, we talked about prairie plants and sort of woodland plants, but um, in our area, we also had savannas where uh, mostly oak trees were growing. So it was a combination of grassland and, and uh, you know, native herbaceous plants that were growing partly in shade, partly in sun. And I just want to say that um, a lot of plants can take a little shade, uh, like sun loving plants need five to six hours of sun, but they can take some shade. But if it's a sun loving plant, it wants afternoon hot sun. And so it could be morning in the shade. If it's a shade loving plant, it can take some sun. All plants do better with, with light. Um, but it would want to be in the shade in the afternoon if it's a shade loving plant. So that's a important, I think, distinction to make when you're looking at part sun, part shade plants. Okay, uh, I think you answered, someone asked about the book, but I think you already answered. I'm going to the question about Doug Talame. Yeah, uh, bringing nature home. 9,000 caterpillars, not 1,000, so. Yeah, someone asked, is the service berry bush a as good as a service berry tree. I don't know anything about the service berry bush. Sorry, I can't help. I'm with that. guessing that it's basically the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Now, let's see. Um, oh, someone said Doug Talme is, is based in Delaware. Thank you. Um, and someone suggested that you can look up the species at the uh, plants.usda.gov. I also like uh, the Missouri Botanical Gardens has a website. They actually help, help you with the pronunciation. You can actually click on the little sound thing to hear the pronunciation of some of these, which I use. And But it does give a good description, but it's a plants, again, in Missouri, it's not our climate area, but if you're in front of that area, it's a great site to look, find plants and do a search on. Um, let's see, trying to find out. Uh, Jan, do you know if anybody, um, does Snickerbill have a um, ordinance about how high things can be in the front yard? You know, actually, uh, they don't. Uh, there's a woman uh, who has a very large native grounds uh, in Naperville, right along a major thoroughfare. And she has natives uh, growing all the way out to the road. Um, and it's, it actually looks like a prairie in her yard. She actually has a green roof too. Uh, you probably knew who I'm talking about maybe. But anyway, I don't believe Naperville does. They do have a weed ordinance. Like you have to mow your grass. You can't have tall grass and you can't get reported for that. But you can have pretty much tall plants all over your yard and there's not a I don't want to say that for sure there may be something on the books and maybe they just don't enforce it I don't know I, I apologize if that's the case and someone decides to plant but I'm not sure about that uh, so, someone said just recommend that you try to keep it looking tidy you know if you have some grass in the front and mow around your you know your prairie plantings or whatever make it look intentional as opposed to neglected yeah um, trying to get through all these questions, see if there's anyone else. Uh, someone asked if they can get examples of the slides. Um, I can put together a, a, a PDF or, or trans, transfer this to a PDF and uh, we can get pictures of, of some of these plants so you have an idea of what they look like. And as you go through, if you took notes, you can see what they look like. But again, I'm gonna send you the list of plants uh, that we have the, of all these so you can look at them. Uh, what chemical will kill wild onions? I do not know. Why would you want to be killing wild onions? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they, they're where just, they don't want them. Um, you can dig them out, they're bulbs. Someone asks, is there a, in designing, is there a rule of thumb about the number of species versus the area that looks best? I think, what, what, don't put too many species of natives, as, as far as I would like, in one area. I like keeping it simple, uh, repeating some of the elements, except like in my, my I, I treat my front yard different than I treat my backyard. My front yard is more formal. Um, it has more, it looks more designy. My backyard has a, uh, I have clusters of plants, don't get me wrong. I have lots of clusters of plants, but I repeat the elements in my backyard and there's quite a variety I have in my backyard. Uh, and it's taken me, it's taken me, we've lived here 25 years and I've spent most of that time just always working in my yard. I love it. And uh, I, as Nancy mentioned that sometimes plants find a home they like and they end up there and I leave them. Um, and you know, so like I had butterfly milkweed in one area and then uh, it showed up in another area and I left it. It likes it there, it's happy. Um, and so I, 
that's how I feel. Uh, someone said, can disposable mass be used uh, in potted plant base? I have no clue. I yeah. never thought of that. I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that one. What uh, about cutting back perennials? Um, for the most part, we, we recommend leaving them over the winter. You know, the birds can eat seed heads and such, and you can clean them up in early spring. Yeah. Um, and someone asked about placing compost at the bottom of a dug hole before installing, caring for plant. I would mix the compost in with the soil that's around it uh, beforehand. And, you know, you loosen up the soil, the clod, the soil before you put them in around the plant, just so you don't have big clods. Um, so, and uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, do not plant if the soil is wet, uh, you'll compact it. It causes, a, you know, you don't want to do that. If your soil is wet, let it, you know, be pretty much dried out. And once you plant your plant, water it, water it thoroughly. Um, but you break up the clods of, of dirt and I would mix the dirt soil around it with the compost before planting it. Um, someone asked if there's uh, uh, any native vines they were recommend for part shade. <sighs> I use, it's, it's an aggressive vine though, uh, Sweet Autumn Clematis, Clematis diascorifolia. It, it has beautiful tiny white flowers. Um, it attracts bees, believe me, in the fall it's covered, but they, I walk by it all the time, they never bother me but it can be an aggressive vine. Just FYI, I pull it out every so often in other locations that I don't want it. But it's very full. It's on the north side of my house. It does not get any sun till late evening, um, about probably about four or five o'clock. So it can tolerate some shade, not full shade, or it won't flower as much, but it is an aggressive vine, just FYI. And I just literally cut mine back to the ground almost and it, it will come back. So that is one, I, don't, I can look up others, but that's the only one I'm familiar with at this time. Do you, Jan, do you know if DuPage County has a noxious weed program? I do not know. I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, I don't either. And then someone asked about the cost of a um, conservation at home visit. We do not charge for those visits. We would be happy to take a donation, of course, but no, there is no charge for us to come out. And someone asked about, um, should you amend the soil with peat moss or compost before planting? Uh, more and more people are placed they're restricting and preventing the use of peat moss because it is detrimental to the whole habitat where it's actually removed from. from. So that's why we recommend composting as much as possible um, and incorporating that. As Nancy mentioned, there's a video coming up and there's one online, but I would highly recommend uh, get, using compost from your yard. We've turned our compost pile, it's a big pile of dirt um, and it's worked great for amending the soil, the clay soil. And I understand, I used to live in Raleigh too. Here's, there's clay, but in Raleigh, they have that red clay, which is absolutely horrible. Uh, <laughs> it, it is horrible. Um, let's see. I'm not aware that daylilies are good for pollinators, are you? Not that I'm aware of. I have daylilies and I don't see any bees or insects around them ever. Maybe that's just mine, but the varieties I have, I do have some, again, one of my compromises. Yeah. I uh, I see daylilies as being, you know, they provide some color, but not much in terms of benefits to the native habitat here. Right, right. I'm looking up, uh, let's see. Uh, they, someone said they have a lot of common milkweed growing in their yard. What is the best way to work around the plant? Um, I'm not sure what, I mean, if you want to plant around it, you know, you probably can. I mean, I, I would to... definitely add plants. I mean, if you think about it, in, in nature, they don't grow in huge colonies. You know, they would have grassy things growing amongst them, something like switchgrass, um, the prairie drop seed could be added, and then any of, you know, monarda, um, purple cone flowers, those would all fit in well with the common milkweed. Um, someone asked, are there native planted gardens in DuPage County that people can visit? Um, the more natural ones, some of the park districts have native gardens. I know in Naperville, a lot of the parks have native gardens. Uh, Glen Ellen has uh, native gardens. Those are, and in Villa Park, we planted some native butterfly gardens along the prairie path, along the wall there. But also we did, the, the garden I showed and mentioned was the one in Naperville at, if you're in this area, at the City Hall, and it's a hidden garden. It's right next to the building. It is on the east side of the city hall. And it's a long, 14 feet long by 10 feet wide about. 
it's a long linear garden anyway, but it's all native. There's like a, a path you can walk through it. I got to get, and it actually down below that is JC's uh, park, and they have a native uh, planted rain garden down there. Um, it was just put in last year, so it is just growing. It's just coming back. So those are two that I'm aware of that in our area. And also, if you're at the DuPage County Fairgrounds, happen to be out there for some reason, uh, they do have uh, some native gardens there. I don't know if you know of any more. Uh, I was just going to mention the Forest Preserve District um, building on um, Naperville Road, just north of Butterfield, has some really nice native plantings around in its parking lot and such. Yeah. And um, someone asked about seeds. Another a catalog that has uh, seeds and it's Prairie Moon Nursery. It's a great source of seeds. They also have bare root plants that you can order from. A lot of, they have natives. It's a wonderful catalog that I do get and we use. Um, let's see. Oh, so you answered that one. I'm just, I'm still going through. Maybe you're ahead of me, Nancy. Uh, someone asked about worrying about pest management for natives. You don't want to manage the pests on natives. You want to encourage the uh, native, you don't, you don't want to spray them with anything. It will kill the butterfly. Um, I had an issue. I had common milkweed in my backyard and on my side yard. Now my neighbor next door sprays for, sprays for grass. And so I've never found any uh, caterpillars or, or, or chrysalises on those plants. I found them on my other side yard, but not where the, the so you really don't want to uh, treat your plants at all. The natives, I should say. Uh, let's see. Still going down. I don't know if you're ahead of me, Nancy. Yeah, I don't know ginger lilies. Never heard of them. Uh, someone asked, what best way to grow blue lobelia from the seed, seeds from head? I have no clue. There's actually some, you probably might be able to find a source online. I don't know. I'm not a horticulturist, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I, I mentioned that Prairie Moon Nursery, they do give hints sometimes if you go to their website or, and have information about uh, starting these plants from seed because some of them need coal, they need uh, scarification. There's a lot of different things and I'm not certain of all of them. Uh, so here's someone asking if there are other state conservation foundations, if other states have conservation foundations and I'm sure they do. Is there one particular spot where you can go? I don't know of a particular spot. I know in Michigan there is a, we have other programs that are, uh, what do I want to call it? Um, part of conservation at home, they have it in Michigan. I can't, don't know exactly where, but there are other conservation districts in our area. I know Blake County has their own conservation district, but I don't know of a single source that has like a home page for it. Does accreditation? Um... Those are land trust alliances. That's for the, so land trust alliance has a, that's what we are a part of. That's who accredited us. And they have a list of uh, land trusts throughout the country. And you might want to contact them and see if they have a program. Not all yeah, do, but some do. would have a list of, of the accredited uh, conservation right. organizations in your area. And also, um, if you're in Cook County in Chicago, uh, they, there, is a con uh, the, there is a conservation at home organization there that could certify your yard or, or, or do yard visits. So that's a, that's a possibility too. Yeah, Cook County is partnering with us. Also, oh, someone said Vir Virgin's Bower Clematis virginiana is a good substitute for autumn clematis. It's not as aggressive, uh, grows in both sun and shade. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, where is that? I'm going to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, how much space do you need to grow common milkweed since it spreads? You don't need a big patch. It's so upright. I have mine. Literally, I have a fenced area that is 18 inches wide, and my milkweed is right next to it and it's a little plot and they grow up right in that area now they do start to seed and go other areas which is fine with me um but it, you don't need a big area for the milkweed at all they get tall um but you know you don't need a large area uh, I'm still looking oh someone suggested uh, native savannah and woodland gardens were installed across the street from glenbard east high school and glen, glen ellen uh, and new prairie gardens are going to spring so there's another source uh, in Naperville, Naperville North High School has a, a native landscaping. It's not labeled, but there are native plants along Ogden Avenue. Uh, someone says New York State does. I don't know what they're in reference to. Glenbard East, West, Glenbard West instead. Oh, West, sorry. I'm trying to get through all these. Uh, oh, thank you, Glenbard West, thank you. I, I, I saw it too pop up. 
Uh, someone said that in Pennsylvania, they have Penn State Cooperative Extension. Uh, yeah, the co-ops, uh, co uh, co those are great sources. If you have those in your state, New York, New North, uh, North Carolina has them. Oh, and Batavia has a wildflower garden at, at the Riverwalk. Yeah. Uh, someone said in Missouri, Wildflowers Nursery has a great catalog with information and photos available online. It's uh, uh, at mo, mo wildflowers dash net dot uh, three. Anyway, try, probably type in Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. You might be able to get some plants. So if we've missed any uh, questions that somebody posted, um, probably about time to wrap up. So yeah, we've been going <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so there was a question about compost. I would go to the video, but how do you know when your compost is finished? Um, it's when it's sort of, I mean, it's warm, it looks like soil, it breaks apart easily. Uh, you, you turn it every two to three weeks and to keep that oxygen, it needs oxygen, bacteria, and moisture. It, you don't let it dry out, let it stay moist so that bacteria grows. Um, it but it takes about three months. And it left in it. Right, it takes about three months and if you have it over the, you can overwinter compost, it's just not gonna grow the bacteria and start again next year. It's sort of hibernates, don't get it wet and don't turn it in the winter time so that the stuff stays warm in the center. So that's uh, answered that real quick. Okay, and yeah, somebody asked about um, killing black swallowwort, but I am not familiar with that at all, so. I'm not here. And someone pointed out that, and some, like again, I'm talking about plants in, uh, our region, they said in some areas the autumn clematis is actually considered invasive. So, um, so I don't, I'm not familiar. Same thing. Some plants here, like I know, multiflora rose is considered invasive in some areas, and some people can oh, still yeah. plant it. And uh, in our area, uh, burning bush is invasive. It's not. You can still purchase it, unfortunately. And same with the uh, Calary pear, uh, Bradford pears. They uh, are showing up in all the uh, native areas, and yeah, it's a tree. I don't recommend Bradford pears anymore. No, no. They're, they escaped and turning up everywhere. Uh, someone asked when the next program was. Uh, <laughs> well, our, next, you mean next Wednesday? We have them every Wednesday. No, I think they mean our, I think they mean the continuation of our program. Oh, we we will um, be posting on social media and Facebook and such. Uh, we don't have another webinar scheduled right now. Maybe maybe at the end of the summer we can show you. Um, yeah. But something we you know definitely need to emphasize is that it's not going to be an instantaneous uh, <laughs> change. You know, it does take a couple of years for the plants to grow in. But we'll be we'll be keeping you posted through social media. Yeah, yeah, we're just uh, so yeah. That's time is is going long here, and and if you so um, you have my email address here and Nancy's, and if we didn't get to your question, feel free to email me, uh, J Rail. That's how you pronounce it. Don't look at how it's spelled <laughs> at the Conservation Foundation org or or Nancy Sonato there at the bottom. Email us uh, with your questions, and we'll try to answer them um, as soon as we can. Yes. So with yes. that. <laughs> I think uh, I'll stop sharing. Uh, let's so, so thank you everyone for participating. We had this is one of the biggest ones we've had uh, ever uh, sign up. So we have a lot of questions still. Yeah, lots of questions. So thanks for your your input and your questions and your interest. Yes, thank you. And follow us along, uh, as Nancy said, on social media. We're going to keep showing the progress of this garden throughout the years and. And as she mentioned, phase it out. I mean, that, that shade garden, we're a not-for-profit, so we don't know how much we can afford this first year. So we'll, we'll do the best we can. So thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm going to shut it off, and you can find us on uh, YouTube. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye.